So three times I went down to the Black Lives Matter protest. I'm 66 years old, so I've been to many, many demonstrations over the years, but this one was really different. There were all these people, hundreds of people, chanting Black Lives Matter, holding signs and placards and with Black Lives Matter on their t-shirts and face masks, all these white people around me, all of that energy. And I must say, it was surreal in a way. It was a little bit disconcerting. I, at one point in the distance, saw a young white woman and on her back were the words, if they open fire, stand behind me. And I saw that and I felt emotional. And I actually thought of my young grandson, who's always been a bigger boy. Even at 12, 13, he was six feet tall. And then as now, I worried that someone might see his clowning around or his horseplay as menacing or threatening. And what I know about America is that even being an unarmed, innocent child is not enough to protect him. So when I saw that woman with those words on her T-shirt on the back, I felt a kind of connection with her. But I also wondered, could I trust her? Could I trust her to stand with me in the fight against anti-Black racism, not just at that protest, but between the protest? I wondered if that fervor that led her to put those words on her back, did it come with analysis or would it fade when the excitement uh, around the protest wore off? Could I trust her or would she get race fatigue when she understood that we would be fighting for racial justice, not just now, but next year and the year after that? Would she be with me when she realized that there are no quick fixes to centuries of Black enslavement and decades of government-sanctioned race discrimination? So it raised in our conversation, uh, Terry, what does it mean to be a good ally? And I, when I saw that woman, I wondered, would this be someone who would be willing to stand with me uh, in the long term? Because that's what this fight is going to require. We, we did talk about what makes a good ally. And we, um, I think that's difficult for a number of us who think that we have good intentions and we're certainly trying hard, but we're also making missteps. Um, we, you and I had talked about a lot of the, the pushback and the verbiage around all lives matter as opposed to black lives matter. And mm -hmm. I, I, I think I get it, but is there a way, a better way I could explain it to people that I know? And you gave me that great analogy about the woman on the beach. Would you share that? So what I said is uh, a mother's on the beach with her four children and they're all in the water and she notices that one of them is really struggling and so she focuses on that child and it's not that she doesn't love her other three children she loves and adores her other three children it's just her attention right now is focused on the child that is struggling and I think that when we, were, we talked about that and you looked at it that way, that was a way for you to uh, understand what it means when people say Black Lives Matter. It's, it's a great way. It's a great story. And I did, um, Donna referenced that I also write, and I did steal that, but I, with your permission, and stuck it in a column so that I could yes. advance that story. Um, we talked a bit too about what real change looks like. It's one thing to say we want to make sure that we're more inclusive in our uh, nonprofit board, in our events, in uh, 
those things that we do so that there are more people at the table. But you were great to explain to me, it's not enough to be at the table. Why don't you explain that a little better? One of the uh, expressions I always struggle with a little bit is uh, diversity and inclusion. And what does inclusion really mean? And I think often what it means is if you behave, you will be invited into the circle. And once you're in the circle, the expectation is that you're there to maintain the status quo. And when that happens, then I think we often don't have true diversity because the people who are there are there under certain conditions. And those conditions are made very clear. You'll hear in certain interviews, oh, we didn't think so-and-so was a good fit. That's, that's often what that means. And so I think to make real progress here, that we have to think about allowing people to come into the circle with their whole self. Because in the end, if we're just there, if I'm just there as decoration, um, then the benefit of having those diverse voices are there. And I think the other piece of it is, when you invite people into the circle who are not like you, the outcomes are going to change. I think very often when people think of diversity and inclusion and they bring, they make the circle more colorful, they don't really expect anything to change in terms of priorities, what's important, et cetera. And if you really want those new voices to inform the future, to inform outcomes in the future, it has to be allowed that they speak with their full self. We talked about using an example for that so that it became more tangible. And I come from a background where we put on lots of fundraisers like any nonprofit. And you and I talked about what would that fundraiser look like if it really was authentically changing. And I said, well, you know, we used to have this big fundraiser. It was at a fancy hotel, the St. Regis. They helped us with food and beverage. We had a certain price ticket. We had someone do the lovely flowers on the lovely tables. And we did a, say, $150 ticket. So let's talk about how that event would be different if it was going to be authentically inclusive. So it invites people to think about how that event is going to be. Because often what happens, the uh, new person comes into the circle and maybe has some different ideas about the venue, maybe has some different ideas about the music or different ideas about the caterer. And what typically happens, because the people in the circle are smart people and they're you know, in the world experienced, they will talk the new person out of the caterer that they might recommend because of course the caterer that they've always been using has been carefully considered and vetted. And the same with the venue and the same with the music. And in the end, nothing changes. And that's what I mean by if you have new people in the circle and you listen to them, it's gonna be a different party. Uh, there's no, um, there's no value to you if the, it's going to be the same party, no matter who's in the room. We also touched on um, something that I really hadn't given enough thought to, which was, it's one thing to say that the first black judge, the first black general, and what it means to be in the room where it happens. But you made me look at what is the cost to be in the room where it happens? Help no, and this, yeah, and this is when I was saying, making the point about what inclusion means and that we are often asked the price of being in some of these rooms is to not come in with our whole selves. And one of the things that's interesting about this moment, you now hear generals, black generals, or you hear very senior black executives feeling that they can speak more candidly about their journey uh, up the ladder. 
and the times that they had to be silent when maybe they didn't want to be silent or things that they saw that they couldn't uh, speak out about. So there's a price for this uh, conformity. Uh, there's a price for not allowing people to come with all of their full experience. So what does that mean? So to me, that means you don't, during this Black Lives Matter period, walk down to your senior Black executive and say, Bob, can you do a two-page memo on this for me? That for me is not a serious effort. Not that Bob should not be part of the conversation, but I'd like to see companies approach this like they would any other big strategic initiative. So there's a budget, there's staff, there are metrics, there's a timetable, it's reporting to the CEO, and it is not just you know, a small project, a beautifully crafted uh, corporate statement on Black Lives Matter. You, you have a book club. You've, you've talked to me a bit about your book club and um, who's reading what. And two books have come up, um, White Fragility and White Rage. Give us a little bit, more, a few more titles that we ought to be reading, paying attention to. And then if you're comfortable, Tell me a little bit about your book club and what transpired lately. So I'm going to focus actually on white rage. So if you're, if you're going to read anything right now, I'm going to say that's the book to read. The reason that I say that is that we don't really understand our history. So when I look at uh, what does it mean to be a good ally, one of the things for me it means is to be proactively anti-racist. And that you get the versus, I'm a nice person, I'm not racist, what's for me to do? There's that posture. And then there's proactively anti-racist. The people who are there, they get there through a process. And part of that process is self-reflection. They look at their own unconscious bias. They look at how they came up, their family, et cetera. But they also take an unflinching look at this enterprise that is America. And they look at our shared history on race. We talked about, um, I'm going to go backwards for a second, about inclusion and about uh, corporate inclusion. And we talked about the commitment of putting products on the shelf, for example. Talk a little bit about that, black products on the shelf. So there is a uh, pledge right now where uh, companies are being asked to uh, set aside 15% of their shelf space for black owned products. If you are a company that is signing this 15% pledge, you also have to be involved in the operational part of it. How are these companies going to successfully deliver on that pledge? Who, where are they gonna get the financing? How is your procurement department going to work with them a procurement department that typically is working with Asian companies. They're negotiating on price in a really aggressive way. A small black owned business may need help ramping up to get to that 15%. So companies, I don't want them to just sign the pledge without considering some of these other things or what will happen is three years from now, when we don't reach that goal, everyone will be, you know, well, we really tried and, you know, we just couldn't get the products. You know, as a retailer, what it takes to deal with you, what it takes to be able to uh, serve a multi-store national chain. So it's going to require that you work closely 
with these companies to ensure that they're successful. Or if you don't work with them, you help them or you identify a partner who can work with them. Otherwise, these sorts of pledges are performative from my point of view. I want you to tell me right now, tonight, what are you worried about? I worry that we're gonna squander this moment. 26 million people hit the streets, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, in the middle of a pandemic, we're morally called to come out. And we have an opportunity here to create a moral and just America. We have an opportunity to create a highly functioning, multiracial, multi-ethnic society where race and zip code don't determine life outcomes. And I see a lot of things that are performative. I see companies coming out with beautifully crafted statements. I see, uh, I don't see the, uh, the heft behind some of the um, programs that I'm hearing them talk about. And I'm someone who, I do think symbolism is important, but it's not the only thing that's important. So I worry that we will either squander the moment because we don't understand the urgency that's required, or we don't understand fully the magnitude of what we're addressing, and that people may not have the commitment to be in this in a sustained way. This is going to be both a straight vertical lift, parts of it will be a slog, but parts of it are also going to be an adventure. You know, I like to say that momentous change requires both creation and destruction. There are systems that are going to have to be taken down and there are systems that are gonna require all of our talent and creativity to build. And to do that, we're going to have to be in this for the long term. And I worry that we might not have the, uh, what it takes to do that. So then the flip side of that coin, what are you hopeful about right now? What I'm hopeful about is everybody who knows me knows I love TikTok and they groan because I'm sending them TikToks at two in the morning. Yes, you are. You too, Terry. And she knows I do it. What I love about young people and is the, so I think part of it is this. When you look at the demographics of people over 65, it's like 80% of them are white and 20% are something else. When you look at Zoomers or Generation Z, it's pretty much 50-50. So whereas in general, 75% of white people have no contact with anybody black at all. They don't know anybody in their network. They don't have anybody. With these young kids, they know each other. I go into friends' homes and when I look at the grandchildren, it's almost like a mini UN in there. So what gives me hope is that as this proximity where these younger people are actually seeing what's happening to their friends, it's not remote for them, that that will lead to a different outcome. And the, you know, more than half the people who took to the streets uh, were people under 25. So that gives me hope.